and welcome to The Moment with me, Maxine Mawinney. The trauma of combat is mental as well as physical. My guest, Philip Ingram, recalls how inside he was falling apart, but had to have a strong facade to command his troops. More than once, he contemplated suicide. <laughs> Philip, what was your moment? Maxine, my moment goes back to 2005, um, just before Christmas, and I was sitting in my office at Basra Airport, uh, deployed there supporting one UK armoured division. And it was late at night, getting close to midnight. And I sat in my office. I was tired, emotionally absolutely shattered. I had been there less than a month. And I sat down at my desk. I drew my pistol. I put a magazine of um, ammunition into it, cocked it, and put it to the side of my head. And was squeezing the trigger. And just as I started to squeeze the trigger, I felt complete calm and peace. And at one with everything, everything was solved. And then my dad came into my head. And I looked around at the wall behind me and thought, this is going to leave a horrible mess. I don't want any of my soldiers clearing that up. I put the pistol down, unloaded it, cleaned it, and put it back in my holster. How did you get to that point? Well, I was having a particularly difficult time at home personally before I deployed. Um, and my marriage had been breaking up um, uh, since the, the summer beforehand. It probably had been breaking up for a lot longer than that. But in the September before I deployed in December, um, I was in um, Iraq on a reconnaissance um, and the senior officers go out and have a look to see what uh, is going on, what we need to change, the pre final preparation we need to do before we go. Um, and I remember flying in with the general officer commanding and his chief of staff into the Italian contingent headquarters. And we were coming in in a Chinook helicopter. And just as we were coming into land, I could smell the aviation gas burning. I could feel the heat coming up from um, the, the air circulating from the ground as we landed. And suddenly a cold shiver went down my back. And I thought, I have to phone back to Basra. Um, and we landed and I gave my excuses because we were going straight off to a briefing and got you know, quite strong stirs from the, 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 the general and from his chief of staff in particular. Um, and I went off and phoned back to Basra to the person that I was taking over from um, and said, you know, asked him, what's happened? I've just got this urge to phone you, what's happened? And his response was, Phil, I can't tell you. And I then knew something serious had happened. And I said, look, this is me. I've got the new general. I need to brief him what's happened. And he explained to me that there had been an incident in Basra where um, a convoy, a, wheel, a vehicle convoy coming out of Basra had been attacked by an improvised explosive device. Um, and um, uh, an officer called Major Matt Bacon had been killed. Um, uh, a number of other soldiers had been seriously wounded. One of them was from my battalion in Germany. Um, but Matt Bacon was going to be uh, one of my staff officers that was out in um, Iraq when I was there. He'd been my company second in command and he was a friend. And therefore my introduction within 48 hours of arriving in Iraq was a friend of mine who was traveling from inside Basra out to the headquarters at the airport to see me that evening. And that was one of the reasons why I was in the road. Um, my introduction to Iraq was him getting killed. What happened then? Well, then, you know, I, I went back to prepare the final part of my battalion to go and myself to go. We had Matt's funeral. Um, I had um, uh, my junior non-commissioned officer who'd been seriously injured was in Selly Oak in Birmingham and setting up all of the welfare to support him uh, in his recovery um, and make sure that um, uh, everything was left so that if any other casualties happened, and I fully expected there to be uh, a, a significant number more um, then with all the welfare mechanisms set up in the battalion to do that. Um, I, I got to the stage then where I had to focus on the professionalism. It, it was focusing on getting the job done, getting my soldiers to go out. You get this self-belief, you get this confidence that you're the only person that can take things forward. And it was my soldiers, my battalion, the preparation that was going. So, you know, I did what virtually every army officer does and puts his family second as I move forward to focus on, on the operations. Um, I deployed to Iraq at the beginning of December. Five days after I deployed, um, I got a phone call from my um, uh, battalion second in command who was looking after the rear party to say that my wife had um, emptied our married quarters in, in Germany 
Um, and, you know, that set the scene for what was going on through the, the December. So you were struggling with your personal emotions and at the same time having to be this professional soldier. I'm sure that's something that's replicated with many people in the forces. It is. You know, the one thing that you're trained to do, it's probably in your personality, is you're very good at putting a front on. I don't think at any time through the illnesses that I had, people actually realised what was going on behind um, and no one realised that I'd got to that point with the loaded pistol. Um, and there were several incidences through the rest of the tour in Iraq, which took me close, not quite as close, but took me close to doing the same thing again. Um, it's, uh, and with that front that's there, um, it, it is, you're almost living a split personality. Um, and that's what people can't quite understand. At what point did you realise there was something going on or that you needed help? Well, the, the Iraq tour, there was 13 British service personnel killed while I was there. Um, and you know, I was leading the intelligence operations. And I took every death, I took every incident personally. And the first question I asked when an incident happened was, what had we missed? Um, and I went back and looked through all of the intelligence that we had to try and identify what there was. One of the frustrating things was that I didn't have the tools that I needed to process the intelligence, to look at the vast quantities of information that we had in, to look for the subtleties that would suggest that an attack was going to happen at different times. So there probably was things that we would have missed if we'd had, uh, could said we've missed if we'd had all the tools there, but we didn't have all the tools. But I, I took each incident very, very personally. So were you getting worse then during this period? I, I was getting worse. And, you know, I remember um, an email that I sent back to my um, boss in the UK saying, you know, I can't take much more of this pressure because um, I'd just been told that my successor uh, had resigned from the army and wasn't going to come out and they couldn't tell me when I was going to leave. And, uh, and I then sent an email saying, no, I have to get back. I'm going to meet in an airplane out of here on this date. Um, and the day I flew back, um, and typical, the RAF aircraft broke down on the way back, so it took me two days to actually get that short journey back to, back to Germany. Um, the day I got back, I was interviewed by um, my boss in Germany, um, a brigadier, and uh, at the end of the interview, he was so concerned, he formally wrote on paper, uh, he wished to formally record uh, his concern about the welfare and well-being of this officer. Um, and um, he sent that off to one of the army personnel departments. Were you offered to help? No. Why not? No. Um, I was the commanding officer. Um, I uh, the but formal that, chain of that matter. Should it, that it shouldn't matter? matter. But the formal uh, chain of command above me was confused. Um, I looked after my soldiers and had mechanisms in place to help them. I didn't think I needed help. So no one was looking um, after you? So there was no one looking after me. You know, I went to see my GP because I, I wasn't sleeping, first of all, and, and therefore you, you got to see the GP, but you don't say, and I'm suffering this, and I'm suffering this, and I'm suffering this, because you're keeping a front on it, yeah. and you're recognising that you know, you're in this position, you're but, living in a small community. But what I don't understand is, given that you're in the forces and this does happen, considering you're in war zones, why is there not more done for personnel? Well, I understand there's a lot more happening now. <coughs> I understand there's a lot more happening now, but um, at the time, um, it was one of these things where you know th this this is this is all a little bit messy. We don't really want to How get involved in this. It? This was 2005, 2006. It was 2006 when I got back, okay. and um, because of what was going on in my personal life um, and the pressures that had been in Iraq, I fell into a stress-induced depression. Um, now, I, I did see my GP and got referred to an army um, psychiatrist um, because of that, but the psychiatrist was treating it as a medical condition and therefore was put on antidepressants. Um, at no time was I um, assessed for PTSD or anything like that. But that took me a couple of years before I got to do that because the psychiatrist was actually a personal friend and it's very difficult to break down in front of a personal friend. There'd been indicators during that time. As I say, the interview that I had with um, my brigadier when I got back, um, I, I got promoted and moved on to a new unit in the, in the same place. Um, I remember breaking down in tears in a general's office. He had a full colonel in tears in his office and never asked why. I never suggested that there might be something that needed to be looked at. Did, did you understand just how unwell you were at that point? No, I didn't. Um, it wasn't until uh, I was talking to my psychiatrist um, and he said, oh, as, as a matter of indication, you know, how many times do you think about killing yourself? And I said, what, per week? 
per hour, per day. And he said, uh, per week. I said, let's go per day. And I said, probably 25, 30, 35 times. And that's and, the point you'd got to. And, and that, that's the point I got to before I started to get my uh, treatment for depression. And so he started to treat me with, uh, with drugs for, for depression and working through that. And uh, they helped. Um, but they mask your emotions and they mask everything else that's going on. Um, and, you know, it, it got to the point where you know, it was affecting my military career. Um, it was time for me to get out. I, I um, came back to the UK um, and then um, left the army after, after finishing um, a, a six month job just, just before I left. Um, and you know, as I left, I was interviewed by the army's most senior personnel officer, um, the adjutant general. Um, and when I said to him, you know, what sort of help do I get? Um, he opened his drawer and pulled out a very poorly photocopied list of um, the different military charities and said, there you are, that's what helps you when you're outside. When I went to the doctors and said, what's going to happen here? They said, hmm, we're not quite sure. Um, we'll give you three months worth of tablets and um, then it's up to you to speak to your GP whenever you get out. Are you better now? I am, but it took me a long time to get better. You know, from uh, 2010 when I got out, it wasn't until 2014 that I got diagnosed with PTSD. And during that time, my life had been in turmoil. You know, I was running away from everything. You know, relationships, um, I'd run away from them. Jobs, I'd run away from them. Um, anything in life where it was settling, I'd, I'd run away from it. And I didn't know what was causing it. Um, and it was... Um, early 2014, um, my then girlfriend, now, now wife, um, we had a big bust up. Um, and um, you know, after that, she, we went for a walk and she said, look, you need to get help. If you don't get any help, there's, you know, there's no future for us. Mm. Um, and that was the first time that I sat down and really stared into what was going on inside me, my behaviour, and I realised proper Philip wasn't there mm. and I needed to sort that out. How long did that take? Well, I went to my GP. Um, I got fast-tracked um, through my GP into uh, the Dudley NHS um, uh, counselling um, system, the, 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 the uh, psych uh, uh, psychiatric treatment that was there. Um, and you normally get 13 weeks is what they expect. Um, I had 43 weeks of treatment. Uh, 43 sessions of treatment mm. um, and my counsellor at the time, um, a lovely lady called Michelle, um, you know, I likened to the surgeon that cut out the bad cancer of this um, horrible disease that I'd got and hadn't realised that I'd got. Um, and then um, you know, my uh, wife, Sarah, um, as the nurse who you know, nursed all the surgeon's hard work back together to bring proper Philip back. So proper Philip is back, but if proper Philip could look back to that moment of yours, what would you do? What would you change? Well, it's very difficult to change things because the moment happened to me. You know, the circumstances happened to me. Um, if I could look back with 2020 hindsight, maybe I could um, get myself into treatment earlier. Maybe it wouldn't have affected um, you know, how my life had gone at that stage. But there's times in life when you're doing the control, alt, delete, reset and reinstalling all of the software again is the right thing to do. And for me, it's been the right thing to do. Um, the one thing that uh, I describe myself as is a PTSD survivor because there's so many other people out there who are suffering silently or are not with us and they haven't been recorded and never will be recorded as a casualty of war. Um, and I think that's such a shame and would actively encourage anyone who is, thinks that they might have the symptoms of this horrible disease to seek help because it can get cured. Philip, thank you very much. Thanks, Cynthia.